Okay, I think we're going to start, Diego, so we don't go over time. Uh, so, welcome everyone again. My name is Arnon Mello. I'm going to put here this next slide, so a little agenda and um, the speakers today. So again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Arnon Mello. I'm the founder and president for Mello Hawk Logistics. We are a freight forwarding firm here in Canada, in the US and Brazil. And we're doing this series of uh, webinars to talk about the disruption in supply chain all over the world and in Canada. And uh, today I have a, the pleasure to welcome you Marcel Andrade from Lucalex, someone that I've known for many years. And I, kn I know what his company has been doing for years, helping Brazilian companies or international companies penetrate in Canada and vice versa. So we're uh, gonna hear a lot what Marcelo has to say about the effects that COVID had in the world and and uh, and to some companies that he deals with. So I'm not going to read his bio. You're going to get this presentation after. You guys can also find Marcelo on LinkedIn. So anyway, thank you, Marcelo, so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Uh, a pleasure, I know. A pleasure. Good to see you again. Um, I'm going to talk quickly about Mellow Hawk. We've been in business for 17 years. Um, 150 partners around the world, and uh, we have done and we do uh, ocean air freight, ocean freight, uh, customs clearance, trade shows, consulting and logistics, uh, and planning and customs clearance. So we are a full um, service provider in terms of supply chain. We do warehousing as well, and um, it has been uh, a challenge a challenge uh, for us. At this time of COVID, we are essential services in Canada, so we have been open since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, legally, we can be open. Um, we have half of our staff working from home and half here in the office. We have a warehouse, so we're managing uh, everything remotely, uh, but it has been a struggle to adapt sometimes to issues with carriers and airlines, and we're going to talk about this a little bit further. Uh, Marcelo, I would like you to introduce uh, Lucalex to everyone, please. Thanks, Arno. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I am in Toronto for uh, quite a, a bit of time, about 21 years. And uh, a few years ago, I founded this company, Lucalex, which now we are about eight people. Uh, we are pretty much a consulting business, helping uh, companies from other countries uh, find the best possible path in this custom, in this Canada journey, like uh, the, the chart says, right? So we, we do a few different things depending on the state of certainty the company has about them coming to Canada and also in terms of how much they know and what they want to do here. So it starts from a very simple diagnosis that pretty much is just for the company to understand if Canada is a good fit for them or not. So we can do that very quickly to help them figure that out. Uh, we also get a little more involved at, a, let's say, an exploration phase where they are interested to start to engage with partners in Canada, but they may not know very well how things work in Canada. So we lend a bit of a hand here and there with uh, uh, some very specific mandates at this exploration stage. At the preparation stage, uh, it's actually something much more robust. It's something that we do for about three months, where actually we, we do help the company create this, what we call the viability plan, which essentially is what you should be doing and what are the specific steps you should be taking in the next 12 months to make sure you maximize your chance of success in Canada. And finally, we also provide support at an execution phase uh, when the company already decided that's what they want to do and they want to do that more efficiently, more quickly, shortening their learning curve and reducing the uncertainty. So we can help companies all along the way. Not every single company goes through every single step because the, by the time they get to us, they're already somewhere along the journey. And so some will go one, two, three, four, but some won't, right? So yeah, so, and we've been working with a few companies it's been 30 cases in the last uh, three, four years. Since 2015, it's been 30 companies that we helped in, in this journey. And many of them, about 40, are operational in Canada right now. Amazing. I know you've dealt with some government agencies as well in Brazil, not only private companies, but you helped certain governments dealing with specific projects. So um, I, I know you have, what you have done in the past, which is amazing, which is great. So thank you. So thank much. you. Thank you. 
Also, I want to mention that if we can, uh, we're going to leave some questions, the, the question period for the end, so we can just focus on the topics and then we'll open up for, for questions and um, people can uh, direct their questions on the chat so Diego can monitor for us. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to give an update what's happening in the world uh, right now in terms of air, ocean, and the Canadian government or international uh, issues that are happening right now. Uh, so Air Canada, of course, uh, is not flying to 90% of the destinations they used to fly before the COVID. Uh, some destinations uh, open up on a cargo capacity only where they have changed the configuration of their planes. So a cargo is being taken in a cargo hold, but also taken where the passengers uh, were sitting before. So. Uh, as of June 1st, Air Canada has new cargo destinations, uh, Bogota, Lima, Amsterdam, Dublin, and Madrid. And these changes are coming up on a daily basis. And also cancellations are coming in on a daily basis to some of the flights that they operated and it, eventually they could cancel in a couple of days. So, um, so sometimes what you hear in the news is not the reality of what Air Canada is doing in terms of, of freight. Um, so we have to be on, on top of, of that. Lots of issues in China, of course, as a gateway congestion. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, governments from around the world uh, got uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, equipment built in China, masks, gowns, and they're leaving China, and China was completely overwhelmed. Uh, huge regulations for the exit of these products uh, from, from Chinese authorities. Uh, what the news that we have is even people who have the eight or nine licenses that they need to have in China in order to export um, uh, a COVID product, at the runway, at the time of loading the plane, customs would cancel the authorization of export of that product. So people prepaid thousands of dollars for these products. Uh, they prepaid uh, the freight charges in advance because no freighting company, no, no logistics company in China is giving you credit for, you can imagine, $9,000, $15,000, $20,000 $20, in freight alone to export some products. And the very last minute, customs is blocking that shipment from being loaded in the plane. And we had reports of flights from Canada departing China empty because they were not allowed to be loaded. This is a huge scandal uh, that is happening due to a series of backlogs because as you heard as well, some of these products uh, were not to, up to standard uh, in Canadian market. They got here, they were not what they were expecting. They couldn't be accepted, they were not used, and I'm sure it happens in other parts of the world. So huge congestion there. So when people ask her about air freight from China, we already have a prepared answer for all of them because there's lots of criteria and lots of risk involved. Um, ocean update, uh, huge switch right now in the world of uh, electronic bills of lading. Instead of doing original uh, bills of lading, which most of you know, when a shipment is shipped via ocean, you have an option of doing electronic um, uh, release. If you know the parties involved, if you don't know, then you do original bills where you have to carry the bill to the destination so that people can retrieve their, their, their product. So there is a, a, a huge switch now to everything electronic. So uh, we people can save money in courier and expedite the delivery of their uh, products. Um, also, uh, the, uh, what do I have? The dangerous goods, Canada business. There is a piloting now to um, uh, test e-shipping documents on dangerous goods. Again, dangerous goods by air, huge uh, uh, problem. Uh, specified by IATA packaging. It can only be done by a shipper or an authorized company to do a dangerous goods. A freight forwarding firm is not allowed to touch or create documents or labels for dangerous goods items. Um, we are only here to verify that the shipper packed it properly in accordance to IATA. There is regulations for ocean as well and regulations for truck transport. So on the air side, there is a movement to do electronic documents again uh, for dangerous goods, which is going to eliminate a lot of uh, cost as well. Um, UK is planning, of course, uh, after axing 
Brexit to lower uh, duties on some of their uh, products being imported. Uh, so there is, of course, to stimulate business. I'm sorry. Somebody's trying to call me. They don't know I'm in a call. And uh, so there is this coming up as well for the UK, UK um, customs system. And um, U.S. most paying companies tax breaks to pull supply chains from China. So there is another movement in the White House to make an incentive for companies to leave China on their production and their factories and bring those productions to the U.S. We're going to talk about this in this presentation again, that there is a sense now in the world that you have to bring your supply chain, your manufacturing closer to home. And as you can imagine, what happened to China being closed for two months, it disrupted uh, product fulfillment worldwide. And now there is a huge movement in the U.S. to give tax breaks and whatever is necessary to bring these productions closer to home. So we don't have to wait 15, 20, or 30 days for products to come from different uh, different parts of the globe. So this is a little bit of a, an update on what's happening here and in the world. And now we go into the crisis impact and recovery strategies that uh, Marcelo is going to comment and then uh, we'll brainstorm a little bit about it. So Marcelo, thank you. It's your Thanks, Arnold. Thanks. Yeah, uh, we, we, we are seeing, right? Uh, I mean, as usual, a crisis uh, creates very urgent needs. Uh, that's the stuff you have to do right away. And don't have time to think very strategically. We, we switch to survival mode and we do what we have to do to survive. So that would be the short term. Uh, however, this crisis seems to be very different than others, which uh, is not just a regular bump on the road and things are gonna get back to normal, back to where they were before the crisis because it's being so pervasive and, and, and so deep that it's been affecting, uh, I believe, uh, a lot of the ways things people are gonna think about things going forward. So this is really pe putting people to think. So we try to capture some of that. Well, the first thing, again, uh, uncertainty on the cash flow, that's a very uh, short-term uh, reality. And it, you, it may linger for a little bit because uh, of course the financial impacts, you know, things are not gonna turn on like a switch very quickly, especially if we do have a second wave like a lot of people are predicting for the fall. So cash is king more than usual, uh, more than ever. So that, that, that is definitely a, a point of attention there. The other thing we are all seeing, and this is proof of that, we're all here. So I don't know how many of us were used to sit down in front of the computer and talk to a camera all day from their homes. And the fact that we're doing that to now and we have tons of digital tools so quickly, there is an acceleration and an irreversible digital transformation because I don't think we're gonna be able to put the genie back in the bottle after this. Right, a lot of employers are going to see the advantage of not bearing very high real estate costs to house their big teams, and a lot of people, frankly, will not want to drive uh, one hour to sit down on a computer somewhere else. So they can do that from their home. So, and there's tons of technology out there, right? So there's going to be an acceleration and an irreversible digital transformation for sure. I, I heard a joke that not a joke, like that taste that type of jokes, but like I heard a comment saying that. COVID-19 is the biggest agent for digital transformation ever, right? And that's very true. The other thing we can count on, is, and that has not started necessarily in places like Canada, financial distress that's gonna cause very significant competitive shifts. So uh, what happens is that we know uh, a lot of the developing countries got uh, developed countries got addicted to cheap money. That means low interest rate. So a lot of people very comfortable carrying a lot of debt, either as persons, individuals, or as companies. And that is causing trouble now because sure, it could be cheap to keep servicing your debt as long as you have cash flow coming so you can pay the debt. What happens when you have this type of disruption is that suddenly you cannot pay that debt. And, and now you owe the money and you're bound by contracts. So we're gonna have trouble. A lot of companies and perhaps a lot of individuals are gonna get into a very difficult financial situation. And I would not be surprised at all to see a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of companies winding down, shutting down, a lot of people wanting to get out of their business, trying to sell, especially in the small 
uh, and medium-sized businesses and a lot of consolidation. So we can all anticipate a very large movement of mergers and acquisitions going forward uh, in the next couple of years for sure. And finally, the last point here is uh, definitely this very uh, strong community view, right? That, that idea that we are we tend to be more community oriented. You know, there's a saying that says the suffering unites people. And uh, this is definitely times of suffering of everybody. And suffering is even more real for people that you see every day, your neighbor, the business you or the restaurant you used to go that now you see they're shutting down or the local farmer or whatever it could be. So definitely there is a lot of movement happening everywhere, not only in Canada, about let's make sure we support our local community. Let's buy local, let's source local, let's produce local, let's, right? So there is, and, and I don't think this is gonna be a temporary thing. I don't think we're gonna go back to buying anything just because it's 10% uh, cheaper from anywhere. I think we, we're gonna see definitely at least a share of everything we buy. I think people are gonna trade, okay, I'm willing to pay a little more expensive, but I wanna make sure I can have access to it. Because now, as we are seeing now, the major disruption in supply chain, perhaps we've ever seen, uh, we, we, we're we not seeing a situation now where, oh, I'm gonna buy 10% cheaper because you don't have access to that thing that's 10% cheaper. So, but now if you pay 20% more mm -hmm. and you can just put in a truck and drive it here, then you can buy it. So definitely we may see that. And we are seeing a lot of evidence mm -hmm. of all that. And and also we're talking that that the integrity where it's coming from and you know who is producing it, um, uh, right away instead of you not knowing you just uh, on a website somewhere in the world and then you know it's a canadian production or you know whatever close to home as you said so that is going it's changing people's perception of of you know price and quality and integrity and and i i can drive there you know what i mean or or get it yeah Absolutely. We, we are seeing a, a, a reality of all these points happening. For example, the digital transformation, I don't know how many of you are, are based in Toronto, but if you are a business based in Toronto, you probably got an email from the city of Toronto uh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. saying that, okay, we're going to build your web presence for free. We're going to build your online store, your logistics hook you up. Like they're building your, uh, there's a partnership with Google and Shopify to get this all done for free. The city is offering that to every single business based in Toronto. So that's the irre irreversible digital transformation. The financial distress, we already started to see all those shoes declared bankruptcy or uh, credit yeah. protection, hurts, rent a car, right? We already started to see this. And in terms of the community requiring more robust presence, I mean, that, that is, it's almost like a human tendency. Before this happened, we were already were seeing some movements, you know, the Make America Great Again movements or the Brexit movements. There were already, but it was like considered more the populist kind of mentality. And now I think this moved very quickly to mainstream, right? We saw Trudeau the other day on TV say, buy Canadian food because our farmers need you. And I can guarantee people are going to go to the market now and look at the sticker in the Apple and say, is this Canadian or not? Okay, let me buy the Canadian, even though it's a little more expensive and not as pretty. And Marcelo, you mentioned as well, was it Shopify who uh, no longer will have offices and everybody's going to work yeah, from home? Yeah, is that, uh, They absolutely. decided this major change in their structure? Absolutely. Like Shopify, right? For people that don't follow too quickly, it's like not even a household name, but Shopify became this month the largest Canadian company by market capitalization. So that means Shopify is worth more than the Royal Bank, right? Which is crazy, right? It's a company pretty much that, that provides the infrastructure for uh, e-commerce across the globe. And they announced last week, they are not going back after COVID, restrictions are lifted, they're not going back to corporate offices. Everybody, they're gonna be 100% working from home. They may have the odd office here with meeting rooms for this and that, but <clears throat> all their workforce is gonna work from home. That's major, think about that. The largest Canadian company by market value just announced they, they're gonna continue working from home 100%. That's wow. huge, right? 
and I think I think that's a trend that we're going to see in other companies as well. Uh, the adaptation to this: look how much gas you're saving, how much expenses you're saving, driving from places and causing causes to the environment. Of course, it's endless, but but and we all see how productive we are being remote, right? Me here in the office today, but tomorrow I can work from home and do everything exactly what I do here from home. So, uh, you know, it's, and, and I, I think we're, we're very glad to be in an area in an era that we have this technology to help us continue to be productive. So I'm going to move to the next uh, slide here. Um, this is it. So getting back to the new normal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, again, like, it, it, it's very region. hard. We, yeah. we, we start to get into a crystal ball exercise, of course, right? We don't know exactly what the new normal is going to be. But of course, we, we if we're learning anything these days, people are talking about model, about trend, about statistics. I mean, there are some certain undercurrents that are becoming very clear, right? So I guess we try to capture some of these here, right? So uh, definitely, you know, like, uh, uh, like you have to, to, everybody needs to start to look with a fresh eye to their own business, right? Uh, like uh, how good is the quality of the information that you have? You know, like having something written in a paper at a binder in a shelf somewhere doesn't work anymore, right? You have to have that, that shared document on a shared drive That's so right. everybody can edit, collaborate, right? Uh, the agility, the accuracy of the data and the information, knowing where we are. I mean, we became data addicted these last days. I mean, everybody knows about the Johns Hopkins University model. Everybody is checking on worldometer and the peak and the curve and the flat, we're flat and plateau, where we are in the curve. I mean, all these are statistic information about the data. And we all, you know, like even kids are talking about it now. So it's no different from the companies, right? I mean, internally, you know, like if you don't have key performance indicators, you know, uh, you're, you're going to develop some, right? Because again, especially in times of financial distress, that's that's going to be part of the difference of those that are going to survive and those that aren't, right? And, and of course, with these disruptions of supply chain, I was trying to buy an item here on Amazon the other day. And it's great, like back in February, it would be here in three days because we have Amazon Prime, right? Or be here in two days. Now it's November. That's gonna <laughs> arrive here, right? Wow. And so, so I guess that the the the, uh, the vulnerability of the supply chain that happens to me as a consumer. But imagine the companies that have their supply chain some critical items that they have to manufacture to assemble something they do. Yeah, one one of the things that that we have been doing since this we've been doing all along for seventeen years, but now more than ever is. Uh, people are having difficulty sometimes receiving a container because their facility is closed. So they're looking for third-party operators, freight forwarders to help them manage the stress of how and where to take their product once they land here, if they're coming from abroad, because their staff is not at the factory or the warehouse is closed. They have minimum staff. And you're gonna, I believe you're going to see more, and we, we, we ourselves are seeing this. We're helping more people now manage their supply chain and distribution more than ever before because they don't want to spend money and hire a warehouse and staff to look after their product when they can go to a third party that can manage uh, everything their stock uh, provide reports online they, ca they can view what they have in stock that's the software we have so we're doing more and more of that to, to Canadian companies now because they just don't want to be uh, bothered looking and searching and implementing a system that already exists from a third party like ourselves. So um, as you're saying, like you, you need to, to evaluate your supply chain and the vulner vulnerabilities of it because yeah. uh, again, you don't know what's gonna happen. Unfortunately, I don't wanna be negative, but the changes, is, it's not only here, it's worldwide that affects the entire chain. So you have yeah. to be prepared to adapt. And a great example for that, if, if it's starting to look, wow, well, I don't know, the supply chain inventory, what they're talking about. Well, let's think about something very simple. We all need toilet paper. The reason why we ran out of toilet paper is because toilet paper is a very bulky item with a small 
uh, cost per volume. So it's extremely expensive to warehouse. Uh -huh. So nobody warehouses wear toilet paper. So toilet paper inventory is always in the move. It's a just in time thing. What happens? We had a disruption in the demand. People went there and bought everything they could. Guess what? No supermarket had more toilet paper in the back. They had more pasta, they had more rice, they had more other stuff, but toilet paper, no, because it's bulk, it's expensive. And then there's no distributor with an inventory with a stock of toilet paper. The factory didn't have a, a, a stock of finished goods waiting just to ship. They had to produce. So toilet paper, one of the reasons we were out of toilet paper for so long, the only reason we have it now is that everybody bought so much of it <laughs> that nobody's buying the same volumes anymore. So there was time for the production to catch up with it. So this is a good example, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, the, the smallest things and like this, you may have all sorts of electronics, uh, mechanical components, certainly in the medical field, you know, anything to do with the medical area that's considered, considered critical, people are going to be very reluctant on trust, having the faith that that inventory that used to be kind of just in time, oh, there's always a ship arriving, there's always a container arriving every Tuesday and Thursday, wow, no, so now I think we're going to see the growth of those intermediary inventories, so by all means, call Melohawk and try to get some of their uh, storage capabilities there for in your favor because you're going to need it. You don't know when the shipment's going to come. Yeah, we it, exactly. This planning uh, has been more than ever in supply chain. If you are in supply chain and you need supply chain, you always planned ahead. But now everything got so delayed and disrupted that it created a, a, a chaos that is going back to normal a little bit on the ocean side, but air continues to be disrupted uh, worldwide. And we don't have a day that we think is gonna, is gonna start to go back to normal. We, we, we don't have that. And if it does, the prices are already triple what they were before for air freight costs worldwide. So we're, we're, we're waiting, we're waiting. Um, Marcelo, I, I wanted you to say, I was gonna speak in Portuguese, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to say something uh, the right message and communicate with the right audience, how important it is for you to focus on the audience, right? Do you want to communicate? Um, I think it's very important because I think we, I don't remember if it was earlier in this call or in a previous call that I had, like there's the increased importance of the human contact now. Like before, we were used to just rely on something we could find in a website and fill an automatic form and get the bank to issue the letter of credit. It was all very automatic because the trust has been established to a level that you didn't need to have one-on-one -on -one human interference or human contact anymore. You're, it was very easy. Everything works, right? You can rely. There's going to be toilet paper in the shelf when I go to the supermarket. So why should I bother? Why should I buy more? So what's happening now is that that trust is very shaken. Not on anybody's fault. It's not a matter of character, of specific regions being better or worse than others. It's not a matter of race. None of that. It's just a fact of life. Factories are being shut down everywhere because three employees tested positive. You have to shut down the factories. They're going to ship the goods and so on, right? So what happens is that more than ever, people want to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. People want to talk to somebody they trust. And so that whole idea that there is this global network of a very well-oiled machine that's going to work well and it's all automated and all you have to do is to fill the form, make the order, uh, that may still be working for Amazon. But I think especially on the B2B space, people want to talk to somebody. They, can, they want somebody to guarantee. And, and again, that, that is connected with that idea of community. People will tend to trust more in others that are part of their local community because they can see it. They can take the car and drive to the warehouse and see that uh, mm -hmm. the machine is making the goods you know, as opposed to hoping that something's gonna arrive in a ship or in a plane from somewhere, right? Yeah. So the importance of the right message and communicate with the right audience, it's all about communication, understanding, try to have an understanding of your demand, to understand how much you have to buy, to know, understand how much you have to stock, to understand when you have to reorder and all that, right? Yes, uh, I, I can say our our the history of Mellow Hawk has been about this personal contact. This the fact that that you speak to someone uh, and it's the same person that takes care of your, your account. Customer service is a real thing and it's a very important thing because it passes confidence, it passes trust, integrity. Uh, going back to what you said, you people and clients more and more want to know, like 
a voice, you know, at the end of the phone or at the end of the video now, because everything is video, right? You call and you see the person. And I've been in calls where people said, but I can't see you. Like, you know what I mean? There, there are people expecting to see you, who you are, right? The voice, the image behind the voice or, or the email. So um, I think you're going to see a, 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 a greater importance given yeah. to this effect. Just an example. I, I don't know about you, but I don't do phone calls anymore. Now, now everything is, okay, let's, let's have a Zoom chat. Let's go on Microsoft right. Teams. Let's go on whatever, yeah. Google Meet. There's like a hundred tools, but uh -huh. you want to see the guy on the other side, the person on the other side. Yeah, so exactly. that thing about, oh, send me an email or, or, or call me. No, it's now it's uh, a video call. People want to right. see. So we are using technology to communicate, to, to connect. And also, um, how important it is for you to benchmark your business with others in your own uh, industry, I guess. So, so I want you to talk about that as well. Yeah, well, compare. It's, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 one of those things. You know, we have a lot of the herd mentality. We heard that term a lot about investments, right? When everybody's buying stocks, is not the time you want to buy stocks, right? because the herd mentality. So that there has been a very well-established trend where everybody was doing a certain thing like everybody else because nobody knew who started, but everybody was doing it, so it must be right. Well, that is over, right? I think it's like uh, Warren Buffett says, is when the tide goes down that you see who was swimming naked, right? It's, and it's very true now. It's like, what does really make sense and what does not do? I mean, you have to talk to people who have to think about what are the critical factors, preparing, uh, having the benchmark, seeing if something everybody does, but it doesn't make sense, then probably nobody should be doing it, right? What are the, the benchmarks? What are the leaders? Who is doing better than others and why? So it's time to, to leave the autopilot and think a layer a little bit deeper. It's time to get the right help. It's time to talk to people that know what they're doing. It's time to see who's doing well versus who's not and talking to them, right? And it's time to think, just plain simple. It's time to slow down and think deeper, right? And so the importance of the benchmarks uh, with other industry players and, and, and the connection with people and the planning and the preparedness, uh, this all come with that, it's together. Like, right? Yeah, together with the models, with numbers, with data, with analytics and all that. Yeah, and with logistics and supply chain, which is crucial if you are in this business of distribution, because we hear uh, some clients coming for consulting and they didn't think about supply chain or logistics until the end of the process of analysis. I think that process has to come in the beginning or all together as one because you can segregate you know sections if you're moving a product or building a product somewhere else you need to understand how much you're going to pay for duties and taxes and the transport is going to cost that has to come and some people don't think of distribution and supply chain when they're thinking of a new idea you know and uh, we always tell them look you I, I need to give you the scenario what you're going to face with this product importing into Canada or exporting into Brazil you know, like you need to, you need to know what you're going to pay to see if the production of that product is going to be worth it or not. And if you're just dreaming of something or you actually have the right data to, to move forward. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So we'll go here to in summary. Um, so as we talked about price volatility will remain uh, not only the cost of goods, but also the transportation of goods as we see it. Um, Air freight prices continue to rise. We don't know when and if they will go back to what they were back in February before uh, the big COVID uh, pandemic started and uh, flights were canceled. Um, we talked about the paperless economy is a trend as we can see everything is done digitally. Uh, also, I didn't mention in the beginning, but customs in Canada, for example, some documents for customs clearance you needed to actually take a piece of paper to the counter of customs at the airport, which is open 24 hours, seven days a week in Toronto and some parts of Canada. And you needed to stamp, they needed to stamp that piece of paper with a blue ink stamp. And then you pick up that piece of paper and you go to the terminal at the ocean freight, whatever terminal, and you present that paper in order to retrieve your goods. So those are some scenarios that now that stamping is done digit digitally 
and then uh, Customs has created a system where they receive that email, they validate who is the customer, who are the parties, and they basically give a digital stamp and now they allow that shipment to be cleared. A lot of shipments are cleared digit digitally uh, by brokers already, but before there was this paper movement. So we see more and more industries and markets going paperless, which is, which is fantastic because Brazil nowadays is not per paperless and it's a big headache to clear customs in Brazil as most some people know, right? Um, and uh, supply, supply chain unpredictability, unpredictability as well is, uh, um, is it, it continues, it will continue. So I encourage you to work with your logistics provider who they are in order to bring the latest information and, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this webinar so we can bring to you what's happening in different parts so we can all kind of plan together and hopefully we can help you uh, plan uh, your your uh, logistic supply uh, chain, uh, and I need a greater sense of cooperation. You said that you you're talking with your clients, you're talking with your suppliers, you are um, uh, discussing new methods to improve your system, right, Marcelo? You can't work alone anymore. You need you need to share information in order to succeed. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and again, it's 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 time for intelligence, right? It's not time to autopilot to do things automatically like we always did, because that's how it's done. Because the way it's done, it's been questioned, it's been tested, and, and in many cases, it's been invalidated. That way, it doesn't work. There are things that are gonna return to a kind of normal because they have to do with social distancing and agglomeration of people. And as soon as we have a vaccine, which I hear it's probably gonna be early next year, the University of Oxford is already testing 10,000 people there. So it looks like we're gonna have a vaccine early next year. So some of these restrictions are gonna go back, but the psychological scars and the financial scars, they're gonna be permanent because what we learn in this very short period of time, and we learn by questioning things that we believed in for the last 30 years, these new learnings are gonna create a different uh, uh, long-term. So it is time for us to, 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 to think about that, about what, what that means. Like, so things, I, I, this time all, almost reminds me of what happened in Brazil when we had something called the Plano Real or the Real Plan, when they stabilized the currency and inflation disappeared. What happened at that time in Brazil, for those of you who are not Brazilians, is that a lot of companies were profitable, but they were just profitable purely because they had a very good financial manager. So operationally, the company didn't make any money, but their financial manager was so good at their investments that the company in the end looked like it was profitable, right? And then suddenly inflation disappeared and a lot of companies went bankrupt because now suddenly they had to be operationally efficient, which they weren't before. So there was a very big stream of bankruptcies and restructuring of the competitive landscape in Brazil in the mid 90s because of that. I think we're going to experience a time like that again for different reasons, but it's going to be a different time that's going to expose people that were behind on technology they're not gonna be able to do as well. People that were relying too much on th something or somebody too unknown, now they're not gonna do well. Uh, people who thought they were out of the game just because they couldn't be competitive by a relatively small factor, 10, 20%, well, now maybe they will be competitive because if they are part of the community that they have built, people are gonna give them a chance and they're gonna, I don't think people are going to buy everything locally, but people, I think, uh, will be buying a mix of something that comes from far away, from whatever it is. But I want to complement that with some local supplier, just in case things go bad, I still have something to rely on locally. So I think a lot of people here that have no hope in hell that they could do business anymore, now they will, right? So I think there's going to be a lot of these changes, right? And, and finally, people are going to learn for a very long time, this is going to leave deep scars about not learning and uh, not relying too much on debt. That idea that, oh, interest rate is low, so don't worry, let's just take on more debt. Let's take on more debt because interest rates are lower. Well, what's the worst that could happen? If my revenue drops 10%, I'm still good. Oh, my revenue is never going to drop 10%. Well, 
we're seeing now, right? So I think there are some of these lasting effects that are gonna are gonna be very present in the psychology of the business community for the next ten years at least. Very good point. Yeah, thank you. No, that's that's amazing. Um, also, seek government support, right? Everywhere we are in Canada, we're so blessed that the government of Canada has many from EDC from. Uh, uh, business development uh, of Canada. There's, there's, there's many, like you said, the city of Toronto helping newcomers or new business establish, and they have training as well, seminars in supply chain. So we are very blessed to be here. If you want to be in this business, that you have government support and funding, uh, if necessary. Um, other countries don't have the support that we have uh, in Canada, of course. Um, another interesting point is the, can the new NAFTA agreement, the CUSMA, which is we're going for the Canadian terminology here, uh, that takes effect in July this year. New rules, new changes, new form. If you're bringing goods from the US, you need to have a NAFTA, otherwise you will not benefit from tax-free. There are some conditions. Also CETA that we didn't mention yet, but the comprehensive economic trade agreement with Europe. We, we saw a reduction of 100% zero duty on our clients' imports from Europe with CETA being in effect. So huge trade potential with Europe um, and Canada. So, so look for those government agreements as well to, to, to help you save money, right? Where you purchase yeah. your, your products. And to that point, Arnon, sorry, uh, like this is where Canada is fantastic, right? I'm so proud of, of being here in this country, right? So you're talking about the government support and here's why Canada can provide support to businesses and individuals. When I moved to Canada to study, to do my master's in economics here back in 1999, the prime minister was Jean Chrétien. At the time, debt to GDP, so that's the amount of debt the country has compared to how much it produces in one year, was about 66, 65%. Yeah. Today it's 34. So that means Canada has been paying down its debt over time, right? To the point where it can take now on the extra load, and I hope we don't have to go back to 66, but definitely there is room to go a little higher. That's why the government was so quick to jump at helping people. When we know we're gonna pay more taxes in the future to pay for all this, we all know that. But at least the government has a flexibility to help quickly. And yeah. to about the CETA, the Canada, the I, I call Canada Europe trade agreement in my mind is just easier because it's the two sides. I know. The I know. Is I know. Yeah. But but, what, but here's what happens, and this is where Canada is a fantastic place. For those companies that think about Canada as being just another line in their export markets, okay, I'm gonna to sell to Canada. Yes, you can do that, but Canada is a great hub for internationalization. If you use Canada as a place to add value, you can sell to the US and to Europe without tariffs. There's no other place in the world that you can do that, right? So I think that's where it makes it fantastic, right? And, uh, and, and on top of it, just to make the thing even more interesting, Canada has trade bilateral free trade agreements with a lot of Latin American countries that, for example, not even Brazil does. So Canada has trade agreements with Chile, with Peru, with Colombia, right? So Canada is really this unique place that if you use Canada as a base and to the point that we talked about trusting and, and reliability. Canada also has this good brand globally, which is a place that everybody trusts. So I, I, I just say Canada's a great place to be a base for business, not just as a destination export market. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. I mean, we are so blessed to be here. I mean, it's, it's, the support is amazing, right? In comparison to, again, other parts that, of the world that don't have a structure that gives incentive to have your own business or develop your own business. So, of course, lastly here is hang on to your money, seek extended terms, of course. We, uh, in logistics and supply chain, saw some of our contracts canceled from different carriers, a lot of warehouses asking for money up front. We have to prepay for everything. Clients have to prepay for freight more than ever before. So manage your budget, and it, it's huge. Your cash flow management is crucial to this, to this particular time, and it will continue for many months to come. So um, this is uh, some of the summaries. And Marcelo, I wanna go now into the questions because we have some questions on our, our chat. <clears throat> I wanna start here, uh, Ronald ask, um, 
uh, that uh, China air freight customs cancellation is because of paper and product marketing or markings, I mean. Some freight forwards in China told me that they can't find carriers to send uh, from China to Canada because the Canada government is blocking shipments of things like masks, etc. I heard this from two forwarders. Uh, what I know in this topic is, as I said before, on an air freight uh, shipment, there is eight or nine criteria that the manufacturer of a COVID product must have uh, from the Chinese government. So they have markings and certificates and proof of manufacturing uh, at the time of booking and at the time of tendering the shipment to customs in China prior to leaving. So what we heard at, is that if any of those criteria or items don't comply with Chinese customs regulations, the shipment is blocked from being loaded into the plane. Most of you or some of you know that exporting from China is as complex as exporting from Brazil. Companies must have an export license. Uh, if they don't have it, they can purchase a license. But in the case of COVID, it is more complex because of course, there is a huge visibility in the world, a product coming from China that doesn't comply with the medical standards of Canada. So the concern is there. They don't want a product to leave that potentially really was non-manufactured by a reliable company in China. And we don't know that. So clients in Canada that are purchasing, purchasing products in China should know who they're purchasing from for sure, that they are reliable, they are produced as per the standards instead of the stories that we hear uh, you know, um, of some products coming out of, out of China. Um, so as far as uh, they, they don't have ocean carriers to send product to China, I don't agree with this statement. We ship from China on a daily basis. Our agents there who have been our agents for 17, my agents sometimes for 25 years before Mellowhawk, they continue to export and our shipments are moving. So we don't have any interruption of ocean shipments out of China. I never heard of this. And there is equipment. There was a, a slowdown of equipment maybe two months ago, but now the container movement in the world is, is going and equipment is available. So as far as I know, there is no interruption in our lane from China in ocean. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Ana Sudo, thank you for joining us from the consulate in Brazil. Arno, if you could also comment on the availability of containers for shipment. There was a shortage, shortage weeks ago, but how is the situation now? The situation is getting better. As I told a few weeks ago, there was shortage of equipment in some markets. And then weeks later, these containers were delayed in transiting points going to some markets because the destination market couldn't fulfilled the delivery of those containers because factories were closed and so they were holding containers in transit. Um, we see that, that it's, it's better now. It's not back to complete normal, but containers are moving. Sometimes we're seeing a delay of a week or two on the regular transiting time, but they continue to move, okay? Uh, long delays for air and ocean shipments to come out of uh, China. Is there a reliable carriers now? Uh, so. Again, air freight, there is a delay because there is only cargo planes going. Uh, lots of people are making a lot of money because they have to pay for the entire plane to bring only cargo to some markets. Um, again, I encourage you to work with your supply chain provider. We work with people and we receive information from our reliable agents in China that we deal on a daily basis because they are at the front of this information, like we are front of information in Canada through our partners around the world. What we know is what we ask and get information from our reliable agents that again, we've been working for many years. The same applies to Vietnam and Malaysia. Um, again, we get information that movements are happening and delays are happening depending on the carrier, depending on the product, depending who's the manufacturer of, this, of these products. Um, uh, we have a question from Yaron about uh, accumulation uh, markup uh, of uh, landed cost in Brazil for DG. 
Uh, Yaron, this is one of the services that Mellow Hawk does for a lot of people is to analyze what you need as a, cons as a consulting that we do for logistics. We can again uh, help you analyze your situation into Brazil and we can talk to you later. Uh, but yes, Brazil is a very complex market with uh, a five level of taxes on importation depending who you are uh, and the product uh, you're shipping. So again, uh, we definitely can help you uh, if you're willing to discuss with us um, later on. Um, what else here that I'm missing? Diego, let's see. Uh, yes, also I'm asking, Diego posted a link to our survey. If you can please, before we disconnect, disconnect we're gonna leave the, 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 the Zoom on after the meeting so you can fill out the survey. It's important to know your feedback on these webinars so we can bring more information to you uh, later. Yeah, that's all the questions, Arnold. That's all if the I'm, questions. Yep. Marcelo, I, I don't know if you wanna make closing remarks, but I wanna thank you so much for joining us on this topic. There's so much to talk about and I value so much your uh, 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 advice and opinion because you come from a finance background, you have extensive engineering background and finance background when you move to Canada. I know your past history and I value it so much. So thank you again for being here and sharing your thoughts. Well, on thank this you very moment. much for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. And my, my, my last words here today would, would just be, you know what, this too shall pass. This is gonna pass. We're gonna be on the other end of this crisis. Uh, again, there's another say that people say, never waste a good crisis. And I guess uh, the idea here is like, we should learn from it. We should understand, we should never try to fall in denial and think, oh, okay, that was just a little detour on the road. We're gonna go back. We're not gonna go back to, to the same place where we were. And those of us who are able to learn a lot from this and start to prepare for what comes next, there are great things there. Just wishing that everybody stays safe because there is a deadly virus out there. So yeah. I wanna make sure I wish everybody and their families and their loved ones are fine and safe with all that. And, and uh, we'll be fine on the other end. It will be a pleasure to reconnect with any of you anytime. Thank you very much, Arnaud. It's a pleasure to be part of Mellow Hawk. I respect your company deeply, what you guys do in terms of uh, uh, knowledge and support to the local community and the integrity of the business. You and Peter is just like fantastic. It's a pleasure to be considered for your, your webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your kind words. And I want to thank everyone that is joining us in Canada, in Brazil, and around the world. I know some of you are in different parts, so uh, it's an honor to have you here and thank you for participating. So please uh, help us on this um, uh, survey that we have to improve this. And we're gonna leave the Zoom call on so you can copy the link or, or fill this out. There's very a few questions. So anyway, thank you everyone again. Thank you, Diego, for helping as usual at Mellow Hawk uh, in the preparation of this webinar and information until the next one. So be safe and bye-bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Bye.